Welcome to the CircuitPython weekly meeting for August 28th, 2023. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Paul Cutler and I'm a member of the CircuitPython community. What is CircuitPython? It's a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you, wish to su if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafruit.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern and 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it co coincides with a U.S. holiday as it will next week when we'll have the meeting at, on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar that you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive these, dis these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There is a notes document to accompany the meeting and recording. The final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video so you can use the doc to skip around and view the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes. After each meeting, we post a link for the next week's meeting notes document to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a chosen set of items from our Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, libraries, and Blinka. This is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers separate from our status updates. The third part is hug reports. Hug reports are an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome in our community. The fourth part is status updates. Status updates is an opportunity to report on what we've been up to. Take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week. And the last and fifth part is in the weeds. In the weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something that you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. And that's how the meeting will go. With that, we'll get started with community news. Um, this week's newsletter is jam-packed, and I'm just grabbing some of the bigger headlines and highlights from it. So please subscribe to the newsletter because it's a great, uh, a great one this week. Um, PyCon AU was held just over a week ago, and there's two talks to check out. The first is Open Source Communities and 10 Years of MicroPython from Damian George, the founder of MicroPython. Um, it's a great talk. It's a non-technical talk. Um, it's you know about things that can help your community and the social aspects of engineering. Um, I'm almost done watching it and highly recommend it. The second one is from Matt Trentini. You can't do that in MicroPython. Uh, Matt's talk at PyCon AU 2023, MicroPython is great for hobbyists. You can control LEDs and motors. It's so easy, but you wouldn't use it for anything serious, right? Surely not. It's too slow. You can't use all the features of a microcontroller. It consumes too much power. You don't have control over memory. Hint, all of this is wrong. You can do so much more, as, as Anne says. It's, I'll be watching that video next. Next up is Python in Excel. Microsoft combines the power of Python and the flexibility of Excel. They've announced a new analytical capability available within Excel with the release of a public preview of Python in Excel. It makes it possible to natively combine Python and Excel analytics within the same work group with no setup required. With Python in Excel, you can type Python directly into a cell, the Python calculations run in the Microsoft Cloud, and the results are returned to the worksheet, including plots and visualizations. You can check out the Microsoft Excel blog or The Verge has a story on it as well. Um, Python creator Guido Van Rossum shared that he also helped the Excel team with this initiative on Twitter. And the last headline is CircuitPython 8.2.4 was released in the last week. This is a bug fix revision of CircuitPython. Um, a couple of fixed boards and improved messages and documentation were the notable changes. The CircuitPython weekly newsletter is a community-run newsletter emailed every Monday morning. 
The complete archives are linked in the notes document. It highlights the latest Python on hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or project, edit the next week's draft on GitHub, or to take it on Mastodon or Twitter with pound, with, uh, pound circuit python or email cpnews at adafruit.com. And that's community news. Next up is the state of circuit python, the libraries, and Blinka. This is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It gives us a chance to look at the health of the project separate from our status updates. We'll talk about the project overall, then separately discuss the core, libraries, and Blinka. So overall last week, in the last seven days, we had 26 pull requests merge. Some names that are new to me, um, I apologize if I missed anyone else, but Astralia, C. Catuto, and Jim McCown um, were some of the 17 authors. We had seven reviewers with the familiar names and nine closed issues by three people with 14 open by 11 people. And with that, I'll turn it over to Scott for the core. Thanks, Paul. OK, the numbers for the core, we had 20 pull requests merged, which is awesome. Uh, 12 different authors, so lots of folks. Thank you to those folks. We had five reviewers. Uh, some infrequent reviewers are Microdev and Gambler, 21, so thank you both. Uh, we have currently 31 open pull requests, which is more than my like one page <laughs> gut check. Uh, but a bunch of those are super, uh, let's see, Six of them are a day old or less, so you know that's the weekend. Uh, we should be able to catch up and get under that uh, 25 pull request mark to be on a single page. Uh, issues wise, we had seven closed issues by three people and nine open by seven, so we're a little up for a total of 698 open issues. This is the little up tends to be the trend, um, and the way that we prioritize the work for these issues for Adafruit funded folks is through the milestone system. Um, as I tried to imply that if you are, uh, for community members, we encourage uh, you to work on any issue that seems uh, interesting to you. Uh, but for Adafruit funded folks, we tend to use milestones. Uh, these milestones reflect, uh, tend to reflect versions. So A2X has seven open issues, and these are things that we'd like to get fixed into a stable release sooner rather than later. And then we have 49 open issues for 9.0, and that's the longer term new major version stable release that will happen probably in a, a number of months, not, not weeks. Uh, and then we have long term, which is 597 support. And also, mainly, we have four issues not assigned to milestones. So these are things that we want to take a look at and make sure that they're not urgent issues uh, that we need to take a peek at first. And that's it for the core. Thanks, Scott. And now I'll turn it over to Katni for the libraries. Thanks, Paul. This section covers all of the uh, CircuitPython libraries, which is everything in the community bundle and everything that begins with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore. Over the last week, we had six pull requests merged. Uh, two of the names that were read out earlier are new, which is great to see. Um, in terms of merged uh, pull requests, uh, four of them were 23 days or older, the oldest one being 131 days. So we're still getting through some older pull requests and we are down to 46 open PRs. We had two closed issues by two people and four open by four people, leaving us with 636 open issues. And uh, we have 20 good first issue labels. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more. You can get started by reviewing. You can get started by contributing documentation or code. Um, there's tons of options available, and uh, we have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, which includes uh, two sections on reviewing, and uh, we're always available on Discord to help out. We would uh, like you to be able to contribute in a way that works for you. Uh, for library PyPI weekly download stats, this week we had 139,174 downloads over 312 libraries. The top 10 are listed in the notes as usual. Uh, in terms of library updates in the last seven days, we had four updated libraries, but no new libraries. Um, and those are also in the notes if you are interested. And that's what I've got. Thanks, Katni. Now I'll turn it over to maker Melissa for to talk about Blinka. Hello. So uh, this section covers Blinka, which is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this week, we had zero pull requests merged. Uh, there are currently five open pull requests amongst other repositories. Uh, there were zero closed issues and one open by one person. 
leaving a net of 103 open issues. There were 10,576 Pi PI downloads in the last week, 10,361 Pi Wheels downloads in the last month, and we are at 119 boards. And that's it. Thank you. And that is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Next up is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start, and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. If you're text only or, or are missing the meeting, I'll read your notes when I get to them in the list. And first up, I have a group hug for everyone. And next up is C. Grover, who is text only. He has a hug for Liz, Liz Clark for an excellent synth.io examples and musical concepts scattered throughout the fascinating Circle of Fifths learning guide. Special hug to Jeff Epler for the impressive synth.io core module that just works and keeps on giving. Next up is David Glauda, who's text only. Um, he's got a hug for Dan and Jepler for releasing 8.2.4 and backporting many features or many fixes and board support. And after that is DJ Devin3, who is also text only. He's got a hug for C. Grover for the Palette Fader Library and the help in Discord. It's exactly what he was looking for in a project. A hug for me, Paul, for the advice to use Palette Fader. Hug for Toddbot for a really neat SynthIO wavetable visualizer on the Pi Gamer this week. Even if you don't intend on using it, I recommend everyone listens to it. It sounds beautiful. Lady Ada and PT for a particu particularly informative desk of Lady Ada this week that included a sneak peek at a new Octal PS RAM version of the ESP32S3 in 40 pin TFTs of all shapes and sizes. And last, a hug for Foamy Guy for two weekend streams on creating a red team capture the flag style challenge with intentional exploits to find. And with that, I'll turn it over to Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Paul. Um, hug reports for me this week. Uh, thanks to uh, Mark uh, Mark McGookin on uh, GitHub and also uh, has a blog under the same name. They uh, have a very helpful blog post and helpful uh, helper library that is published on GitHub that makes it super easy to work with AESIO module, which is cool because I didn't know that exists. And uh, it's uh, got some ins and outs that you got to do in order to use it. And this person made it a lot easier. So thanks to them. Um, to uh, Michael Pokusa for uh, reaching out about looking into even more improvements in HTTP. Uh, server uh, before I could even get uh, all of my thoughts around what I thought would be cool. Uh, Michael's already on it, so that's uh, really cool. I appreciate uh, appreciate that a lot. Uh, and then uh, the last one for me this week is on uh, GitHub, the user uh, BJAP uh, for supporting a uh, submitting, I should say, a fix uh, in the core for the gzip uh, module. Uh, it turns out that I had stumbled upon an issue a while back and put some information about it in an issue comment, and this person. Uh, has a much better understanding of what is actually going on and has now submitted a fix for that. So that was really cool to see as well. Thanks. Thanks, Foamy Guy. Next up is Jepler. I just have a group hug today. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Katni. Hello. I also have a group hug today. Thank you. Maker Melissa? I also have a group hug for everyone. Love all the group hugs. All right, next up is Scott. Uh, first, uh, a hug to Bill ADAT for the Pico W Wi Fi improvements, and then also to Deshipu for helping folks in the Help with CircuitPython channel. Thank you. And last, we have Todd Bot, who is text only. He's got a hug for Dan H for all the CircuitPython releases, a hug for Clever and CircuitPython Dev for helping me tr try to understand and characterize quad SPI flash performance on an RP2040. A hug for Katni, Dan H, and Jepler for helping me understand Sphinx Read the Docs, and Jepler for a patch in CircuitPython CI that I could use to fix Read the Docs builds for my libraries. A hug for Josh Marinacci for his CP Synth project that reminded me about the Pi Gamer and Adafruit bitmap saver to save screenshots. And lastly, for Jepler for adding socket constants useful for multicast UDP. And that was status updates. That was hug reports. Next up is status updates. Status updates is our time to tell the folks what we're up to individually. I'll start and we'll go through the list alphabetically. 
When I call on you, take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. This is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion becomes too long for status updates, we can move it to in the weeds. With that, I'll get started. I was trying to replace a self-hosted MQTT broker this weekend and use Adafruit.io instead and just couldn't get it to work. Um, I came across the Adafruit-io module um, or library that's in PyPI for CPython. Installed that, it was just a piece of cake. Didn't even know that existed, so there's a little tip and trick if anyone wants to use MQTT and with Adafruit.io and CPython. That's all for me. Next up is C. Grover, who is text only. Putting the finishing touches on the first version of the IoT-based Windless Garden Chimes project, running on an ESP32 S2 Feather with a MAX 98357A I2S amp. The chime physics and waveform harmonics are sounding like the real thing. All that's left for version 1.0 is to model the wind speed probability scheme to create realistically weighted random playback. Version 2.0 will encompass simultaneous wind chimes of various materials and scales. My favorite scale so far is an ethnic minor key, just in time for Halloween, leaning towards camouflaging the electronics in a garden gnome. The reintegrator direct input PCBs just arrived from Oshpark to be assembled and tested later this week. This is a self-powered Class D speaker output to audio line level signal converter called the DI and Pro Audio Speak. It pirates the pow power needed for its dual op amp analog circuitry from the incoming Class D speaker signal. Looking forward to directly connecting the speaker output from a Pi Portal or Pi Badge or Pi Gamer to a guitar amp or my DAW using this device. Thank you, C. Grover. Next up is David Glauda, who's text only. Wanting to make noise with SynthIO without involving my soldering from last week, I used my Pico DV from Pimeroni that adds DVI plus SD card plus I to S plus three button to a standard Pico. After hours of testing with two separate Picos and the firmware could not load, I decided to file an issue. Dan quickly found the bug, fixed it, while Retired Wizard confirmed it working, the PR is now in 8.2.4. Tested a few code samples from Todd and implemented my Pico DV based three button drums with a list to the GitHub gist, um, but it's mostly using Gambler21's drums.py. Thank you. Next up is DJ Devin 3 who is text only today. He's got four matrix panels up and running with the Matrix Portal S3 this week. It's a 128 by 64 squished down version of the Feather Weather script. The highest bit de depth I could achieve without artifacts is a four bit color background image. I don't think a single Matrix Portal S3 will drive more than four panels with a reasonable bit depth for displaying an image. I'm not even close to approaching the RAM limitation, so it has to be a CPU or bus limitation. Plan to experiment with an IMX driving the panels next. Finally had a reason to use Seagrover's palette fader library to dim an image layer with display IO. I'm sure it works amazing on TFTs, but also works pretty well on matrix panels too. And with that, I'll turn it over to foamy guy. All right. Uh, thank you, Paul. Oops. I have scrolled to my hug reports. My mistake. One second here. There we go. Okay. Um, in the uh, past week or so, I was, um, in particular, over the, over the weekend on the stream a couple of times, I was working on a uh, capture the flag type of exercise, exercise that's web-based, uh, which is basically like a small web application that is intentionally made vulnerable in certain ways, and the, the player uh, or the person using it to practice can go and look for those vulnerabilities and find some little flags, which are just strings that are scattered throughout. Um, this is a common type of exercise in the kind of cybersecurity circles, uh, and so I thought it would be fun to make one with the uh, HTTP server library, which is uh, always gaining new functionality, and so it was a good kind of excuse to build something a little bit more complex uh, with that, so I had a lot of fun with it. Um, I have been getting back into library reviews more uh, over the past week. Uh, I tested out couple that were new examples, which is great to see. I always love to see new examples popping up in various libraries. Um, this morning, uh, I started digging into an issue I saw on one of them where the uh, builds inside read the docs are failing. Uh, I thought it was a particular 
library, uh, and I thought it was actually due to a change that I had made, but digging a bit further, uh, and after submitting a fix for that, I found out it's actually a different kind of situation going on, and it's affecting some more libraries as well. So uh, I've got to dig some more into that, but something is uh, going on weird with the themes in uh, Read the Docs when it tries to do builds, it seems like. Um, I am uh, also this week uh, following up on uh, typing PRs. There's some that got submitted and then uh, had reviews, but then kind of got stalled a bit after that. So I'm going back through those to try to get them finished up. Um, I have uh, to look at uh, a little while later on this afternoon. I want to get a chance to look at the uh, uh, Gzip PR, uh, which was put in the core to fix the way that Gzip works on uh, certain types of files. And then uh, last thing I have for the week is uh, I'll be filling in on Friday for uh, Deep Dive. So if folks want to stop by on Friday afternoon and uh, catch the stream, I will be there this week. Thanks. Thanks, Foamy Guy. Jepler, you are up. Hello again. So uh, my main work last week and continuing this week is to um, create a CircuitPython driver for these LED dot, LCD dot clock displays. And that is still at a stage of it doesn't work yet, and it's hard to tell when it will. It's maybe a subtle single bug, or it's maybe several problems in my work in progress code, but got to keep working on that. Uh, here's some stuff that I did accomplish last week, though. I did some uh, documentation build fixes in CircuitPython. I improved the documentation for RGB matrix. In the CanIO module, I added a pointer for uh, people, particularly with the Feather Can, which does not use CanIO, it uses uh, an external module that you load with CircUp or from the bundle zip file. Um, I created a PR to merge version 8.2 to main, although that already needs to be done again because the bug fix for dock building wasn't in there. And as Todd mentioned, I added some constants to socket pool to enable something called multicast UDP. And the final thing I did was merged and reviewed PRs. And that's what has been going on. Thank you. Thanks, Jepler. And I'll turn it over to Katni. All right. So this week, or last week, the Metro ESP 32S3 guide went live. Um, there may still be a couple tweaks because uh, we're because the boards went out. We um, made the guide live before moderating it. Uh, so if there's a couple issues, uh, bear with us. We'll probably catch them. Um, and then next up, I'm going to be doing the guide for the iSpy Pi Beret, which is a little Pi add-on that um, allows you to connect iSpy displays so uh, by the cable. Um, that's what I'm working on. Thanks. And you're up, Maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, so last week I worked on uh, my message board guide, and this week I'm going to finish up the guide and then work on various GitHub issues. That's it. Thanks. Next up is Michael Pacusa, who is text only. Uh, he did, he says that improvements to Adafruit HTTP server, 301 and 302 redirects, form data dot files, support for multiple headers with same name and cookie support for request and response. Very cool. Thanks for working on that. And lastly is Scott. Hello. So um, on my deep dive, on the deep dive on Friday, I was investigating the issue Katni found about the S3 Metro just like hitting the timer watchdog and uh, realized this morning <clears throat> and confirmed it talking with Bomora that we had the problem that uh, the eight megabyte PS RAM uses more pins because it's it's uh, set up to be in octal mode. Um, and those pins are being reset right now. <laughs> so basically after you use them, uh, your PS RAM doesn't work anymore and, and you have problems. Uh, so I'm gonna figure out one why we can why we allow you to mess those pins up. Um, so why is the pin and use check not working? And then on top of that, uh, we're gonna try switching the S3 Metro to quad uh, the quad setup so that those pins can be used. Um, so on the Metro right now, they're used on the SD card and uh, the spy pins, and and we're not gonna be able to do that. So. Uh, when we're pulled the board so you won't be able to buy it and we're going to do a rev as well um but we'll we'll get a build that hopefully will work uh still just not in octal mode 
Um, I was also working on updating SDK configs and the updater script for the IDF5 PR. Uh, once I finish that, I need to do smoke tests on the IDF5 PR, particularly around uh, HTTPS connections, because I've saved a bunch of space by turning a bunch of TLS options off. So it's unclear like whether we're, we're going to need to turn some of those back on. I'm comfortable being pretty aggressive and emerge into 9.0 because we have a lot of time before that's stable. Um, this is a holiday weekend, so I'll be out Friday and Monday. Um, but I also uh, I got I get keys to a new office space on Thursday, and the internet install is set up to be Thursday as well. Um, so I'm going to be pretty busy this weekend uh, moving into that new space. The goal is to work from there next Tuesday if the internet's working and I can get my computer and stuff moved over. Um, I'm going to have a lot of other stuff to move, like all my dev kits and stuff, but that's going to be less urgent. And I got kind of obsessed with how I want to store dev boards in this new space. Um, you know, I've kind of piecemealed together some options, but I think I settled on um, using custom-sized cardboard boxes. So they're going to be like, there's a Ikea Calyx bookshelf, which you, if you think of Ikea bookshelf, you're probably thinking of that one, where it's like, you know, 13 inch uh, square cubbies, and it's like, you know, two by four or two by two. Um, I ordered some custom cardboard boxes to go that will fit, should, should hopefully fit into each of those cubbies so you can stack as many as 10 of them. Um, in a single cubby so that you get like really shallow cardboard boxes so you can just have like one layer of dev boards uh, to go in there and then because they're cardboard you could just write on the side what, what's in there. So I ordered some of those I'm pretty excited about it um, and probably I, I don't know it'll be like a week week and a half until I get those uh, but I'm excited about it too. So that's my update. Thanks. And if you have a if you have a Metro S3 uh, and need the status updates, let me know. Um, anyway, thanks, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Scott. You will have to give us a show us around in one of your deep dives and show us the the cardboard boxes sometime. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I was I I'm considering putting it behind me so that it'll just be there in the, like in the background. So we'll see. Cool. And that was status updates. Next up is in the weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for longer form discussion that come out of status updates or that folks have identified ahead of time. Today we have two In the Weeds, and I'm going to read the summary of the first one. Um, David is proposing that we have a simple test like we do in libraries, but for boards, called simple test underscore code dot pi, that with every board, you get a piece of code that gives you a working demonstration of the sensor, the LED, the buttons, et cetera, whatever is available on the board. Um, that file should cover all of the board hardware features um, that it might have from a micro SD card to IDSO audio or whatever it might have. Um, so that's the summary. I'll let folks take a minute if they wanna to read through that, but I'll turn it over to, for discussion. Um. So the the boards ship obviously with code on them that is a demonstration of of everything when there's multiple things on the board it is Arduino the reason for that is the um testers uh which are what the the boards all go through being tested before they get shipped and it and they get flashed with this with this demonstration code and it is um, frustrating, I guess, and much more difficult to do this with uh, CircuitPython. Um, and so that doesn't really happen. Um, I understand where you're going with this. However, um, it, it adds, it adds a, a pretty big extra step for us to do um, to be able to translate that um, yeah, okay. Um, oh, I see. David says it's not for an in-factory solution, but for first-time user after flashing. Yeah. So the, I think what we do in place of that is we, we do the guides, which obviously have demos that work with everything that's on the board. Um, that is not an all-in-one solution, though. It's not an all-in-one CircuitPython solution because it's obviously broken up by um, thing. I could see... Um, 
I could see if if there was a you know somebody in the community who wanted to take this on, um, we could create a repository to keep them in, um, so that there's a central place to go. Um, but I don't think this is something that Adafruit is gonna uh, be able to to take on um, necessarily, uh, just due to how you know cycles at this point. Um, but this is this is an excellent idea. I, I definitely, if someone's interested in in doing it, uh, we would be willing to help out in in whatever way we can. Um, so, um, that's I think where we're where we're at with it. David said it is a seed. I am planting mm -hmm. it. The idea will grow, and I think that's completely valid um, and an excellent way to be uh, to be looking at it. Um, so I think, uh, I think that's a good, um, I think it's a good idea. I think we just need to figure out implementation in a way that works for everybody involved. Um, so think, that's, that's what I've got for it. I, I, I would be happy to see people to have like simple test files checked into the board directory in the CircuitPython repo. I think that would be fine. So that when people add new boards, they could add a, a simple test there. Um, that doesn't affect anything else, because it, it, it's just a file that gets ignored by yeah. building and so on. Yeah, I mean, maybe we'll have to ex exclude it from Python checks or something, but but we could put it there. I mean, I, I, think, I think that's a good spot, because that means that, like, you only have to make one new PR for a board. Like you don't have to, do, well, you already have to do it in two places, right? You have to do it in CircuitPython and CircuitPython.org. Yeah. Um, but I think it's probably better to put it in the CircuitPython repo, given that like, if we need to change APIs or anything, like they're all be in there um, and we can do those sorts of changes at the same time. I think there is a little bit of weirdness in that, um, like we're, those those sample files will probably want to reference reference libraries, um, and I don't think we want to have like explicit dependency listings there. But Circup does a good job based on imports anyway, right? So, um, I think that would be fine. Um, David also makes a point about like having these like super portal libraries. Um, and I, yeah, I, I agree with you. Like the, the big do everything libraries are, are great if you want to do what they do. Um, but it would be good to have examples that, uh, that work at a lower level as well. Um, so yeah, I would say like, if we want to have a, a standard simple test for, for different boards, then, um, doing it in the board, board directories would be fine. Um, that handles the cases where the board needs more functionality than what we do in the native C board in it, for example. Um, but as Katni says, like we may not do that for for Adafruit boards immediately, but that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that other people couldn't add the simple tests for Adafruit boards. That'd be fine. But yeah, I like Jeff. Jeff also suggested having a standard way to link to the documentation for a board uh, from circuitpython.org. And I think that's a really good idea too. Uh, it could be in like the metadata and have like an explicit button for it rather than just being in the text on the left hand side, for example. Mm, that's worth doing too. So are there any next steps around this? Is this something that needs further discussion that we would want to open an issue for as an example or what happens well, I think next? I, th I think there's two pieces. One is if David agrees with the idea of putting the, the sample code in uh, in the CircuitPython repo, just starting to make issue, starting to make PRs that do that. And then I think um, for the redesign of CircuitPython.org to link to the documentation for a board, um, we'll have to define like what the Toml is, what the the metadata name is, and then we'll we'll need to get a slight uh, like change to the site um, design. So so we can, yeah, an issue on the CircuitPython.org repo would be good because then we can pull in Tyler to to come up with how, how to make that look. 
And once we can make it look, then someone like Melissa could could get at it to the the gears. Cool. For how to define boards. Thank you. So we'll wrap up the first one and we'll talk about the next uh, item in, in the weeds from Michael Pacusa. Um, I apologize if I'm not saying that correctly. But the idea is for a REPL.py file that would automatically be imported and executed on control C when entering the REPL, similar to a bootpy or safe mode.py, which run during specific events. Um, so that's the summary. There's a couple bullets underneath that. Um, outlines some of the, the pros and there's some of the risks as well. I have often wished for a feature like this. Um, in Python, on standard Python, you can set an environment variable, which names this file. Um, and yeah, each time the REPL comes up, the content of that file is executed. You can use it to import things. It's very handy. Um, so after I read this, I've been kind of working on prototyping the addition of this feature. I don't think it's too hard. Um, so I might put in a PR later today, but um, if I don't, it's because I'm doing other stuff, the work I should be doing instead of the work I'm excited about doing because I'm easily distracted. <laughs> and so uh, yeah, I, you could, for instance, you have that um, uh, so there's the uh, run, run file from list or whatever, and I was going to try just putting that uh, before it actually drops into the REPL. So you, you initialize the VM, you have this new code that checks for REPL.py file and runs it if it's there, and then it continues uh, dropping into the REPL to let you do stuff. Um, David in the text chat says, can we do import REPL.py and have the same effect? Uh, you could say from REPL import star or whatever file you want, and that would uh, run the lines in that file in a module and then import every name in that module into the REPL. And so, yeah, this is something that I do a lot I have a file called go.py, and I'll say from go import star, and that will set up whatever it is I keep doing over and over again in the REPL. Uh, very handy and kind of a workaround for not having a feature like this. So in CPython, you said that you have to set an environment variable. Is that something that we should do in settings.toml instead of having a magic file name? Maybe. I'm just thinking of like trying to make it just like CPython. I could try writing it that way if that uh, seems better. I don't know. What do people think? Well, I, I see uh, at least three people who also want this um, besides Michael. So I'm happy to see it added. I just wonder if is REPL.py how we want to do it? The um... Python environment variable is like I didn't know you could do that in C Python. Is uh, Python startup? Python startup. I guess we could just say that defaults to REPL.py, and if you put it in settings, then it overrides the file. Well, I think in case you want to use REPL.py for something else. If you specify a Python startup for a file that doesn't exist, standard Python prints an error, file not found. So I think if that was specified, you'd have to you'd have to specify it. So that would mean there's two things to do, um, as opposed to having a default. Um, I would have said maybe this was a Python 2.7 thing, um, that there was a standard file for this. But I may just be mistaken. If, if so, they abandoned that a long time ago. And you can only enable it by setting the environment variable. I guess my concern okay. is, like, whenever we have special file names, you end up having conflicts, like secret stop. Yes. Is a problem, right? Like, like, is it bad to gate it behind a settings.toml file or not? Like, it may not be. Yeah, in standard Python, there are things like site.py and a lot of stuff. Hmm. I will I will look more into the history of the of this uh, 
setting in standard Python and see if I can figure out what, what is best or what my suggestion would be. But I would love this feature. And I'll stop talking now. Awesome. Well, it sounds like we know what next steps are for that one. So with that, I'll uh, wrap up, unless anyone else has any additional comments. OK, this has been the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting for Monday, August 28th, 2023. Thank you to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on all major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held on Tuesday, September 5th, at the normal time due to the U.S. Labor Day holiday weekend. Uh, this meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you, you can join by going to adafruit.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. We hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.